so um, it's odd talking to a computer when I can't see any of your faces. <laughs> so uh, I hope that uh, you can understand what I'm saying. Sometimes when I get excited, I can talk quickly, but you're used to people with funny British accents because you get taught by Simon. So I feel less worried about that. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit today about information disorder. Now I use that term because I famously refuse to use the term F asterisk, asterisk, asterisk news. Uh, it is completely inadequate for describing the whole ecosystem. Uh, so it makes people focus on kind of fabricated news websites. And so we miss all the other stuff that we need to think about, particularly visuals and memes. Uh, obviously, we've seen the um, dark posts on Facebook. There's a whole host of elements to this. So I like to use the term information disorder. And I'm going to talk a little bit in this presentation about some a report that I wrote in the fall about this topic of information disorder. So I'm going to begin by explaining the work of First Draft, which is an organization that I lead. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about why this question of language is so important and why we need to be very careful about how we talk about it, how we think about it. And one of my frustrations is, again, the use of that term, F asterisk, asterisk, asterisk news, uh, is so unhelpful. And it's so unhelpful because if I use that term um, with certain people, they think that that means mistakes by the mainstream media, while other people think it means fabricated news websites. So when we don't have a common definition, that's problematic when you now have regulators around the world thinking about uh, legislation that might clamp down on this. But when we're not clear about the this, it becomes quite difficult. And I know Simon has said some of you are coming from an engineering background. You will also understand that in that space, you need things to be black and white. It's very difficult to think about gray areas. Those gray areas need to be defined. They need to be explained. So that's some of the things I'm going to talk about today. And then I'm going to end by just talking about some of the key issues. So much of the debate in the US is focused on political disinformation. It's very much geared to Trump. <clears throat> And it's very much focused on the Facebook newsfeed, when actually, as somebody who works across the world, the biggest challenge we have are closed messing, messaging apps. So things like WhatsApp, but then in other parts of the world, you've got Line, Viber, WeChat, KakaoTalk, uh, Telegram. So that for me is where increasingly this type of disinformation is going to be circulating. How do we manage that? And how do we manage visuals when, again, we have got more experience in passing text because of natural language processing. We're better in terms of using computers to make sense of text than we are visuals, but visuals are actually the most powerful vehicles of uh, disinformation. And then finally, I'm gonna end with the thing that keeps me up at night is very sophisticated networks that are attempting to manipulate the mass media and technology platforms. And how do we actually fight that when um, you've got quite a lot of vulnerabilities in a news ecosystem where newsrooms don't talk to each other? So you might be aware that just after the Parkland shooting, some white supremacists were contacted well, on their message boards. They were trying to push the narrative that the shooter was connected to a white supremacy groups. And a reporter from ABC News was in those message boards on 4chan and Reddit and was convinced by this argument and ABC ran with that story. Now, when an ABC runs with a story, then all other news outlets run with it because ABC has run with it. So when it comes to these attempts to manipulate the media, we're, we're very vulnerable. So I'm going to talk about that as well towards the end. So first drafts work. Uh, we were founded uh, almost three years ago now as a coalition of nine organizations and Google News Lab, who Simon works for, was one of those founding partners. And we were a group of organizations that really cared about social verification. So you might have heard a lot recently about fact checkers. And fact checkers are people who traditionally have fact checked claims by politicians. So they were very much looking at official sources. Verification, which is where I come from, my space is about how do you authenticate uh, content from unofficial sources? So uh, a video on YouTube that emerges from Syria, and we're not quite sure who's posted it and whether or not it's trustworthy. Uh, it could be a tweet, and we're trying to work out whether it's from a bot network or not. Uh, we see an image during a breaking news event, and we're trying to work out whether that's an authentic image or is it from a, a related event three years previously. So that's the kind of work we, we were doing at First Draft. It was about training journalists 
uh, about how you verify material that you found find on the social web. But um, last in September 2016, we actually founded our partner network and we now work with organizations around the world, technology companies, newsrooms, human rights organizations, and 30 universities and research institutes. So we recognized that this work was becoming more important and actually there, were, there was expertise across the globe and how could we harness that expertise? So we have three areas of activity. The first one is that we actually do experimental journalism projects. So one of my frustrations, and I'm an academic by training, is that a lot of the research that we have about misinformation and how people make sense of it is has been done with American undergraduates in laboratory settings. <laughs> a lot of this work has been done by psychology researchers, and I love American undergraduates, but I do think there is a need for different types of research. So our goal is to do projects in the field that we can then research in the field, and then from that, from the learnings actually build resources that are relevant to journalists and are based on kind of cutting edge findings. So in uh, 2016, um, we worked with ProPublica and Simon was part of this gang. We worked on a project called Election Land and we actually worked with 660 journalism students across the US um, and learned a great deal about social monitoring and verification on a, in a one day situation. Uh, we then that was in November 2016. Then we moved to France, where there was the French presidential election in May 2017. And we created a collaborative project over 10 weeks, where we worked with 37 different organizations to collaboratively monitor and verify mis and disinformation circulating around the French election, and then published stories on a website, a cross-check website, but also all of the main partners would also publish. So Le Monde, Liberation, France 24. So it had huge amplification, which was, um, we have done research subsequently on that. And audiences were actually more trusting of the content because they saw newsrooms from different perspectives collaborating on what they were seeing. And also newsrooms loved working on the project because although at first they were frustrated that it slowed them down, by the end of the project, they were really proud that they hadn't made any mistakes at all in the 10 week period because they had all been holding each other to account. We then did a project in the UK where there was a snap election and also Germany. Neither of those um, projects had public faces, but we were we had a crack team of students who were monitoring disinformation and publishing newsletters every day to newsrooms saying, this is what we're seeing, this is what's trending, be really wary about this infographic, here's a meme that's circulating, be wary of that, we've identified this bot network. So the, over the last year, we've been doing lots of work about how you monitor during elections, and we've got big plans for 2018 in the US to do something very similar in the for the midterm elections. Uh, so if any of you are graduating and want a job, we should talk after this. <laughs> so here's an example of the research that we did on cross-check. So if you're interested in it, you can find this online on our website. And as I mentioned, um, this term information disorder came from this report that I published with a colleague, Hossein Darakshan. Uh, and again, I'll share these links with Simon, but it's not short, it's 109 pages. But if you are interested in this topic, the reason I wrote it was to try and create a document that took all of the best academic research, but wrote it in a way that was actually accessible. As many of you know, that's not always the case for academic research. But I also was frustrated that there was lots of great work being done by practitioners in the field that the academics didn't know about. So it was an attempt to try and map the field and also provide a new framework for thinking about this. And finally, the training. Um, uh, we have a, a five unit curriculum, which is around advanced verification. So again, if you're interested in how do you forensically analyze a video, how do you do, um, how do you use metadata to analyze a photo? The, the training is all about that. And so we use it with journalism students, but we also use it in, in newsrooms around the world. So the second thing I wanted to discuss was this idea of the need for definitional rigor. I'm sorry, Simon, British people want to put a U in there. <laughs> Um, and this is uh, what I was talking about earlier about the differences between fact checking and verification. This was a Venn diagram that was created by Alexios Monsalis, who works for the International Fact Checking Network. And he created this because he was frustrated at the fact that people didn't know the difference between fact checking and verification. And so he explained, as I said earlier, which fact checking is about claims by public figures. It relies on information from experts and academia and government agencies. 
and it's all about comes up with a conclusion about whether a particular claim is true or not. On the other side, the other circle of verification is mostly about user generated content. It's about seeking primary evidence from eyewitnesses. Um, and often it results in a piece of content being used in a story or not. The problem is now as we face this kind of information disorder ecosystem where a lot of the stuff that we're seeing uh, is actually not that complex. Some of the times it's just doing a, a basic reverse image search or it's debunking. It's, you know, did the Pope uh, support Trump? No, I mean, it doesn't take that long. So what he's saying is this middle space is what's called debunking fake news and viral hoaxes. And increasingly, both of our communities are involved in this middle bit. I've actually changed a little bit to use the language of source checking. And I'm going to explain why in a second which is uh, increasingly, I think, the work that we're doing in the middle of these two circles is investigating the individuals or networks pushing a piece of information disorder. And the thing about fact checking or even verification is we spend a very long time auth authenticating content when actually increasingly we should spend our time authenticating the source because if the source isn't credible, we can get much more quickly to a situation of saying, well, probably the content isn't credible. So here's an example during cross-check in France, um, there was this site on the left uh, looks perfectly like Le Soir, which is a Belgian newspaper. So the people who had created this, it's what we call an imposter site because it looks identical. Um, but, and in fact, all the hyperlinks in this site on the left-hand side linked back to Le Soir, the actual newspaper. So it was very cleverly done. And in this site, for those of you who don't speak French, um, the point was being made um, that Emmanuel Macron was being supported by Saudi Arabia. So it was a pretty big rumor to put out there. Um, so on the right hand side, we did debunk it. You can see here, here's an example of the cross check site. So you can see we say false. And on the right hand side, the logos of all the different news organizations that worked on that story, it got published in this way. So that's why audiences felt that they could trust it uh, to a higher level. But the reason this is such an interesting case study is because it took us probably about 12 or 13 hours to debunk the story, write the story, publish the story. And actually, if we had done source checking, we would have seen that that one link was posted at exactly the same time by four Twitter accounts. And here are the Twitter accounts. You can see the one on the furthest left was created in February 2017, which was a month before this story came out. The one next to it was created in January. The, the third one is an egg and he's called John Smith, surprise, surprise. And the last one is a nice lady with a nice hairstyle, but that account was actually created in Tehran, in Iran. So this was the first anybody would have seen of this site. If we had done source checking, we would have seen much more quickly that there was probably an issue with that site. So that this is actually more of a challenge. And those of you in the room who are engineers, um, this is something that we need to build more tools around, particularly tools that we can give to newsrooms to say, how can we look at the provenance of a piece of information? Who are the sources that are first sending something out? And what are the credibility around those particular accounts? And as you can see, this would have sped things up considerably. So as I started off by saying, this ecosystem is incredibly complex. And this might be something that you've seen I created this diagram uh, last February because I was very angry at the fact that everybody was using this term F asterisk 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 news and they were completely obsessed with these fabricated news websites. And as somebody who has been working in this space for the last decade, uh, in 2009, I was asked to develop a training course for the BBC to teach their journalists how to make sure they weren't being hoaxed, how they could analyze videos and images. And I just thought this whole debate is missing uh, any discussion of, of some of the main things that I've seen and I actually think that we should think about the complexity of this ecosystem. So I created this kind of spectrum and on one end you can see I've put satire or parody and I've had some people come back to me saying oh you know Claire satire is a form of art how dare you put it on your uh, diagram. The reason I put it there is because during the cross-check project in France we saw a number of disinformation agents labeling sites as satire when it wasn't satirical, it was fabricated news, but they knew that if they labeled it as satire, then fact checkers wouldn't look at it. But they also knew, as all of us know, that sometimes satire, our brains don't realize it's satire and it actually gets through. So I don't know if you remember the recent satirical piece about Donald Trump being obsessed with gorillas and gorilla TV. 
I can't see your faces, so I don't know. Uh, but it was a kind of a, a, a very funny, went viral on Twitter, this idea that Donald Trump uh, as visors had created a guerrilla TV channel for him. And we, like many of us saw it on Twitter and thought it was hilarious, but it ended up getting used by certain news organizations around the world who didn't realize and thought, oh, that sounds like the sort of thing that Trump would do. I mean, utterly ridiculous, but satire is not, I don't think that we can completely dismiss satire. So the next one up the spectrum is false connection, um, which is when, you know, clickbait headlines. Um, I'm gonna show you some examples in a second, but then misleading content, which you could argue a lot of journalism is misleading when people use statistics in certain ways, they take quotes out of context. You know, a lot of journalism can be defined as misleading if it is bad journalism. Um, false context, and this was the point I wanted to make, which is lots of times it's genuine content that gets used out of context. So for example, if there was an earthquake now in Peru and you saw that on Twitter, some of you might go to Google and just search earthquake. And in the image results, you would get a whole host of photos of earthquakes from Peru, probably. Now, I've talked to Google about this, so I don't feel bad that Simon's in the room. But my frustration is that there's no date stamp on Google Images. So somebody sees an image and goes, oh, my God, that's from today's Peru earthquake. I'm going to like send them out on Twitter because I want to help people see how terrible it is in Peru. Well, nobody there is trying to cause harm, but that's just genuine content, but it's used out of context. So I call that false context. I also talk about imposter content, which is a really serious problem. Um, and that's when people use logos or journalists' bylines and push it out. It's You can talk about it as copyright infringement, but increasingly it's used um, as a way because our brains are more trusting. So again, going back to the Parkland shooting, you might have read that... Um, somebody actually took a Miami Herald story. So it was exactly the same, but then they changed, they photoshopped a couple of sentences and then sent it out as if it was the same story. And it was only when the journalist was like, hang on, that wasn't my sentence, that people realized. The same thing happened for a reporter from the Miami Herald. Somebody created fake tweets using that journalist's name and a, a, um, account on Twitter, you can, you go to fake tweet.com, you can make fake tweets really easily. And then you create, don't do this. <laughs> I mean, go and have a play, but then do not take a screenshot. But that's what happened. So imposter content is a real worry. And then manipulated content when you have genuine imagery or information manipulated to deceive. So you might have two genuine images, but they're spliced together. And then finally, fabricated content is when something is 100% false and designed to deceive and do harm. So this is this diagram, which is an attempt to kind of show the gray areas and why we shouldn't be using the term F asterisk 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 news. So satire parody, we all know The Onion, although recently I was at an event at Boston Library with the managing editor from The Onion and the average age of the people in the audience was probably 75. And so the managing editor said, uh, how many of you have heard of The Onion? Like two people put their hands up. So uh, this is actually a satirical site from Pakistan. So in an age of Facebook, when you get this content circulating and you just don't know whether this is a satirical site or not, people can get confused by it. Here's a classic clickbait headline, uh, gets used by all sorts of sites all the time. Uh, misleading content, this isn't just uh, you know quotes. This is often we see, uh, well, you guys know this, some of you are data journalists, but some terrible charts and diagrams and here, this was a deceptive, it wasn't a scale, it was just you know, a deceptive graph. Um, we see these things all the time, but yeah, misleading content. And from a regulatory point of view, when people say, we have to stop biased content or misleading content, it's like, that's, as humans, a lot of what we do every day is misleading. <laughs> so uh, it makes it very difficult, but it's about how do we educate people to be more aware of the information they're receiving. False context, here's an example on the left-hand side of a photo that was tweeted out uh, in May 2015, and the person was saying that it was connected to the Nepal earthquake, but actually uh, the original photographer had to then tweet out and say, actually, this is my photo of two Vietnamese, Viet two Vietnamese children, they're not from Nepal. So this is a genuine image, but it's used out of context. So again, when we talk about what's fake, um, sometimes a lot of this stuff isn't fake. It's actually genuine. It's the context that's wrong. But again, coming back to computational responses, it's very difficult to, you know, write code to explain to a computer these kind of examples because you need to say, check the veracity of the image and then check the veracity of the claim and then connect those two things. So it's not an easy task. 
Um, imposter content, as I explained, this is something that actually BBC Africa had to tweet out because somebody had created a fake a video using the BBC News uh, logo on the bottom of the page. And they this was during the Kenya election. So BBC Africa had to tweet out saying, if you've seen this, this is not us. Uh, this wasn't our, our content. Somebody used our logo. Um, and so apologize for that. Uh, the next one is an example actually that came up during election land so simon would have seen this but these are two genuine images spliced together so the image of the people standing in line was from the arizona primary in march 2016 and then the image of the person being arrested if you google now on wikipedia or wikimedia um, ice arrest you'll get this image as the first result so what this person did was they just photoshopped these two images together now, if you take more than two seconds to look at this image, you would realize that there's probably something wrong with it because it would be very strange for somebody to be arrested and nobody to be looking. Human nature, <laughs> everybody's gonna rub a neck. But so if you think that, you're like, of course, that's so obvious, but actually if this is scrolling through your Twitter feed really quickly and this reinforces some beliefs that you might already have, then you're less likely to be critical. So one thing to, to really stress now is that our brains are a lot less critical of images we're much more trusting of images which is why visuals are the piece of this puzzle that make me so worried and secondly we need to stop having this conversation about us being having a rational relationship to information all of us have very emotional relationships to information and this is this is part of it and you can see it here if you believe something to be true you're much less likely to check it out and here we go, fabricated content. Here was an example again from the US election where people were being micro-targeted, particularly for minority communities, and told, hey, don't worry, if you want to vote for Hillary, you can just vote, stay at home. You can just text, you know, you can use SMS, just text this number, you can vote for Hillary. Of course, completely false and an example of voter suppression. Uh, but again, a visual, not just a text. So all of that to say, once I'd kind of put that diagram together, I became obsessed with this need to think about definitions. And so I, Hossein and I came up with this idea of thinking around um, two axes, whether something is false or not, and whether somebody intends to harm or not. So misinformation is when people unintentionally make mistakes. So you sometimes see reporters making unintentional mistakes. You might see my mum reshare something on Facebook. She doesn't know that it's, um, false. She's, you know, she's just part of an ecosystem that's polluted. Now that's misinformation. It's false, but there's no intent to do harm. The middle section here is disinformation. It's when the people who intentionally, they intentionally create or share false information in order to harm someone or an organization. Uh, and it could be fabricated news websites, manipulated audio visual content. And in that I put some conspiracy theories and rumors, although that's harder because it depends whether there's the person who's created it knows that it's that it's false. Um, and finally, we talked about malinformation, which was a new term that we came up with, um, which is actually genuine information, but that is leaked or shared to cause harm. So for example, Hillary Clinton's emails were a genuine type of information, but moving them from private to public was done to cause harm. Or the other example would be revenge porn. That is an actual image of somebody or a video of somebody, but it's leaked to cause harm. So that's just another way of thinking about this, which it might be genuine information, but if it's somebody's trying to cause harm, I would argue there's, there's, that's also problematic. And we also said we need to think about the different elements of information disorder. So who are the agents? Are they official? Are they unofficial? Are they organized? Are they networked? Are they just like, like sad sad people in their basement uh you know what's motivating them is it that they're trying to make money is it they are motivated by political or geopolitical motivations is it that they just want to connect and make some friends or is it some element of psychological so some of the stuff that we see on 4chan with people who are just really trying to cause trouble and harm and i'm like what motivates these people and it's just it's hard to understand that we haven't done enough Research, but there's a psychological element of, the, of that, which is not believing in the world in the way that it works and trying to cause harm to show that it doesn't work. So there's interesting things there to understand. Is it an, is the agent automated? You know, who are they intended to be the audience? There's a whole host of questions to ask just about the agent. And then how do we study the message? What types of message are they? Um, and then how are they interpreted? So my frustration is there's a lot of people who have kind of returned to the way we thought about propaganda in the 1940s. So in communication studies, we used to talk about the hypodermic needle. There was this fear that if you heard a radio broadcast 
whatever they said in that radio broadcast, you would believe. And then as communication scholarship, you know, became more sophisticated, there was this idea, well, no, that's too simplistic. People are not just passive recipients of information. They make sense of that information through their own understandings and their own life experience and their own relationships. So my fear now is we've kind of returned to this idea of oh, if anybody even vaguely got exposed to a post by a Russian troll, they therefore decided to vote differently. And the truth is we don't actually know enough about all of this, but we need more audience research to understand how somebody consumes that information and then what do they do with it afterwards? Do they just passively accept it? Do they click like? Do they reshare? And if they reshare with a thumbs up or do they reshare with a poop emoji? Like we need to understand what people are doing with this and just to believe that somebody sees a message and accepts it uncritically uh, is wrong. And so this takes us to this idea of the three phases of information disorder. You know, actually at the beginning, when something is created, there might be a certain motivation, which it might be a Russian troll who's trying to disrupt an election in the US. But actually, by the time it there ends up on Facebook and then gets pushed out and shared and then reshared by my mum, because she's got no idea and in her head, she just wants to connect with her friends in a reading group, that motivation has changed. So the phases are really important to understand how this, this it, it's not a one, one moment, there's a whole process, a particular piece of information moves through as it passes through the ecosystem. So just wanna wrap up here with um, three issues that I think are really important to focus on. So as I said at the beginning, this discussion is focused on political disinformation, the impact on the US and the Facebook newsfeed. But actually, the problem is global. It involves multiple types of myths and disinformation, particularly around science and health. Um, and the biggest challenge will be closed messaging apps. So these are just some examples. I mean, if you, again, if you're interested in this, read anything that's been written by Rappler, which is a organi news organization in the Philippines, who themselves have become huge targets of disinformation campaigns by the government in the Philippines. Uh, they've done it phenomenal work, but when you look at sock puppet accounts in the Philippines, how they've been targeted, how manufactured amplification has been used in that country, um, it's just stunning, uh, but it's a really important case study to, uh, to understand. Uh, here's uh, one of our partners who are based in Thailand, and they are part of the Thai news agency, and they uh, know that in Thailand, lots of people use the messaging app Line, L-I-N-E. So they ask their audience to submit content to them via Line, which they're confused about or worried about. And then they create these YouTube videos, which they then send out over Line. So it's all done on social platforms. And this is one of the myths, or you know, somebody asked the question, do these little gel packs, will they give me cancer? So this is uh, how they debunked that in Thailand. Um, in India, there's huge use of things like WhatsApp. Uh, we've had protests, we've had people losing their lives in India based on rumors. And um, there's an election in 2019 in India. For me, it's a huge challenge in terms of how we fight disinformation when they're circulating on these closed messaging apps and you can't see them. Um, and then also even in Catalonia, there was a referendum. There's evidence that there was influence of Russian bots uh, in the Catalonia referendum. Uh, in Myanmar, maybe you've been following this, the most horrific events happening in Myanmar. And this has been going on for the last three years. Lots of examples of fake photos being used as a way to inflame tensions um, on the ground in Myanmar. Really disturbing case study again about the power of visuals and how they've been used. Uh, this is a little bit, you can kind of joke about it, but we see this all the time. So um, this is uh, 10,000 retweets and it's from a computer game. We, we've seen quite a lot of this where people share footage saying this is a drone or, uh, you know, this is an attack on homes and actually it's, um, it's from a computer game. So all of this stuff, uh, it's global. It's about a whole host of stuff. It's not just about politics. Um, and this was written by my colleague, Nick Diaz. But as I said, um, if you're interested in this, this is the next frontier. So in the US, we might use WhatsApp to be like, hey, I'll meet you, you know, in the bar at 7.30. In places like Brazil or India or Nigeria, the people follow these huge groups. Some of them are their friends and family. Some of them are just groups that are kind of just sharing fun, silly bits of information, but have become a real... Uh, problem in terms of sharing of rumors and disinformation. And so remember, often these are coming from friends and family that you're more trusting of, comes to you on your phone, 
Um, and this is in communities where they kind of leapfrogged over email. They don't have email. Uh, they don't necessarily want to use Facebook because of data usage. So WhatsApp uh, is increasingly a place where they're turning for all information. But from a journalistic point of view, it's very difficult because we can't get access into WhatsApp to do that monitoring. It's got end-to-end -end encryption, which is very good. Um, but actually, it makes it quite difficult to know which rumors are being circulated. And as I said, whilst WhatsApp is the biggest closed messaging app globally, uh, it's also really important to see all the different messaging apps around the world. And particularly in Asia Pacific, different countries will have different messaging apps that are the one that everybody uses in that country. So again, when we're trying to think about solutions, how do we do this when every messaging app is slightly different? Um, it, you know, it's just it's very difficult to think about global solutions uh, in this place, in this space. Um, and also visuals and memes are the most dangerous vehicles of mis and disinformation. Now, you know this because you uh, live in a, you are of an age where you understand how genius memes are and how they're amazing forms of making, uh, making all sorts of claims or sharing information that are funny, smart, require other people's brains to be engaged in order to laugh, all of this stuff. Um, but they often, in the circles that I move in, people go, oh, Claire, I don't know what your problem is with memes. Uh, they're just stupid. I'm like, they're not stupid. They're very, very powerful. So um, some of you might have heard this. Let's see if I can play it. This is from uh, This American Life episode from January 2017. And it was captured at one of the inaugural balls in Washington, D.C. And it was the Deplora Ball. Uh, and people were uh, being interviewed about how they thought memes played a role during the election in the U.S. We did it. We memed him into the presidency. You him we memed him into Very power. Tech. We shit posted our way into the future. It's true. This is true. This is true. Because we we directed the culture. So you you understand this entirely, which is memes make sense because people make other cultural references and you need to understand uh, contemporary culture or you need to be drawing on a historical culture that, that other people share. And so what they're talking about there about directing the culture is what makes me understand how powerful memes are. You know, often fact checkers can get obsessed with, well, how do we fact check one claim? Actually, what this is all about is how do we shape culture? How do we shape discourse? You know, conspiracy theories are powerful because they're narratives. And as human beings, narratives are what convince us. A strong story is what we want to hear. Like we're driven by narrative and memes are part of that. So just to give you an example from, um, this is from, um, in the run up to the French election, a BuzzFeed reporter called Ryan Broderick did a great piece of um, reporting where he basically got access to some closed groups, some closed messaging groups on sites like Discord and he got access to their chat logs. And what he realized was that there was a, a group of American teenagers who were trying to influence the French election, but they couldn't speak French. <laughs> so what they did was they created these meme shells. So they were using a, a platform a little bit like Dropbox to basically store these meme shells so that people could come in, take these memes and then drop them into Twitter using French hashtags that they were sent messages about which hashtags to use, what time they would have Twitter raids at 6 p.m. where they would all together go in and um, work, you know, to basically create trouble on the French Twitter sphere. So uh, for me, understanding this is a key part of understanding disinformation. Um, and as I said, during the French election and also the UK election, we saw memes as being a huge part of the, the, the information that was shared most frequently in both France and the UK. And so we did a bit of analysis that hasn't yet been launched. And we had 95 um, visuals in total. And just very quickly, you can see when people say, oh, yeah, images. Actually, there's a whole host of different things that we need to think about. So it could be maps, image macros, photographs, data visualizations. Um, screenshots. So there's a lot here of trying to understand the when, it, when we say visuals, what we really mean. And again, thinking about solutions, this is really hard, again, computationally to make sense of all these things. Um, and also, if you remember my diagram of different types, we went and coded the different visuals and the highest percentage was false context, which you might remember is the stuff that's genuine but the context is wrong. So the irony of all of this is that most of this stuff wasn't fake. 
and it was just used out of context. And that's something that we need to uh, really be aware of. Again, a reason why we don't use the term F asterisk, asterisk, asterisk news. Uh, here's an example again of um, during the election, if you, we, you can see the black box, if you just take the colored box in the middle, this was created by this young guy in his bedroom who thought the journalists weren't, weren't doing a very good job. So he basically created this on his computer, going through uh, kind of budget information for different policies. He just came up with this stuff by just using Wikipedia and Google. We saw it and we sent it to Full Fact, who are our partners, who are fact checkers. It took them three days to take all this apart. But then they, they sent this out, this black thing, to try and explain all the elements of this and why it was wrong. This stuff is really complicated and it shows that often we need verification specialists who are experts in visuals to work alongside fact checkers who are experts, excuse me, in claims uh, and different types of kind of political information. So again, when I try, when people go, oh, I just don't understand why we just can't like tweak an algorithm and like we solve this problem. Like it's really, 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 really hard. Um, and then the last thing is, you've probably seen this too, is that people are terrified about, I hate this phase too, deep fakes, which is this idea that artificial intelligence is going to be able to automatically create videos and audios based on kind of previous data. So there's enough videos of me on YouTube that AI could create me essentially saying anything. And this was a, a tweet, I think by a Wired reporter that got huge traffic uh, and it was about showing how AI could kind of change the weather on a particular image and saying we should be terrified. Now, we should be worried, but we should actually be thinking, well, how do we build verification tools so that we can analyze this and see through any of this type of work? My worry is that we're having so many reporters been like, oh, my God, this is the end of the world. It's the scariest thing ever. That what we're doing is just making people go, I, I don't know who to trust. I don't know what to trust. Well, you know, that's probably just it's probably one of those deep fakes. So we do have to be careful that we don't scaremonger to such a degree that we make people just stop trust trusting anything. And um, finally, one of the challenges here is um, those disinformation agents who are sitting on places like 8chan and 4chan and Reddit, their whole goal is to get reporters to talk about what they're saying. Because as you can see here, here's an example during the French election, the the people on 4chan got really excited when journalists started debunking the Macron leaks, which was when uh, Emmanuel Macron, all of his emails and documents were leaked. They loved this because they said debunks are a form of engagement. So there's a challenge here for journalists, because if we keep debunking everything, we're actually giving oxygen to a lot of rumors that don't really deserve that oxygen. So it's a real challenge to know how to report and what to report. And this is another example of um, manipulation. It's not quite about disinformation, but there's a technique by particularly the far right to, for example, on a university campus, put up one poster that's suggesting that there's going to be a protest on campus. Now, if that uh, poster is seen, you often get the university newspaper reporting on like, oh, my God, have you seen this story? Like, There's going to be a protest on campus by neo-Nazis. They report on it, which eventually amplifies that um idea then it often gets picked up by local news media and the people that printed out that poster they only had to print it out once and it essentially has got printed out thirty thousand times so we have to be very careful about the techniques that are being used to get reporters to jump on these types of stories because they know it's going to get traffic but essentially we're ending up doing the work of those people who are trying to spread hate or disinformation and uh, this is a nice example of some really great work about how a lot of the stuff we might end up seeing on mainstream media starts on Reddit, moves to Twitter, moves through this ecosystem, and how in order to really understand this, if we're just monitoring Twitter and Facebook, we're missing the fact that lots of these rumors start much earlier on on conspiracy sites uh, and some of these other message boards. Uh, and we've actually seen now quite a lot of uh, news organizations in the US having to admit that some of their stories have been sourced by accounts that we now know were Russian troll accounts. So you've had lots of newsrooms in the US realizing that they need to do more training with their journalists to make sure that they don't get caught out. And the very last thing I'm gonna say is the verification tools that we use are still horrible. So if you are interested in this space, you should take our online course, but this is one of the best tools out there 
it's literally got a picture of a man with no head on it, a guy who's a private detective. But this is intelltechniques.com. If you want to Facebook stalk an ex-boyfriend or girlfriend, I recommend you go on this site. It's insane. Also go on this site to, re to research yourself and to see how much information online there is about yourself. But here's another one that we use, Jeffrey's Exif. Look how ugly this is. It's called Jeffrey's Exif Viewer. And then here's another one, Tin Eye, Reverse Image Search. I mean, we just don't have a bank of tools. I've been teaching these tools since 2009. Like, if we're serious about source checking and verification, we need much better tools. And that's what I've been talking to Google about. And I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to do some stuff around this.